turn their Bibles to the book of Numbers, uh, especially page 122. If you're using this Bible, uh, grab that on the way in, page 122. If you need a Bible, take it, help yourself, give it to someone. And there's also an insert in the bulletin so you can follow along and remember and, and hopefully re-listen even because uh, it's all listed in there, okay? So we're doing the Foundational Testament series, Genesis we did Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and now we're on Numbers. Uh, the, the title for today is Breaking Free, Breaking Free from What is Holding Us Back. Now, I know nobody here has anything holding you back, but you might know someone you could listen to, you could help someone else, right? So uh, uh, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, numbers 35, especially 51 to 56, we'll be looking at the foundational series Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. We already last week focused on the book of Numbers. If you weren't here for that, listen. Oh, I wish I could do, preach that every week. Amazing. Jesus Christ in the book of Numbers. I just wish everyone could, to, you know, I'm just like, God, I just wish everybody could understand, see Jesus in the book of Numbers and in, in, in the foundational testament and what, what he has done for us how we can have confidence in the Word of God because it's just so powerful. So make sure if you didn't hear that already, listen to it. And if you already listened to it, listen to it again. It's worth it. Uh, but today, the main, we're going to do the main theme of Numbers, which is take the land, taking the promised land. That's really the theme of Numbers. And it's Numbers because they're counting the fighting men. This is a military census. Right? They're counting the fighting men. They're getting ready to, for their D-Day, getting ready to enter, cross the Jordan, and come into the, take the promised land. That's what they're getting ready. So when we do the book of Numbers, once again, uh, we'll say Numbers, one, two, three, four, counting people, one, two, three, four. And then Numbers 33, 52 is our key verse for Numbers, which is, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Destroy all their carved images uh, and, and idols and demolish all their high places. That's the, that's the verse, and you're going to see why that's the key verse in Numbers here today, okay? Now, it's interesting that today, this 2024, Israel is trying to retake the land once again, isn't it? Interesting what we're seeing. They have a small slice of what God promised them in his word. A small slice, and, and they're going to get a lot more. But since 1948, they have been reconquering their heritage. And right now, because of October 7th, they're, they're going at it again. They're, uh, the, the, the battle for Gaza, and now the West Bank is heating up. That's all Israel's land. That's given by God. And then northern Israel, this battle with Hezbollah up north, they, they're, they're starting to expand expand by necessity expand but there should be having that anyway because God promised it to them they need to take that there are many obstacles in their way today many obstacles blocking blocking their battle goals right now there's divided voices divided voices many Jews in Israel and in the United States just want the IDF to stay put don't make any more trouble just like let's give it all back and let's just make peace which is which is a, a lie, right? We, if you've listened to my Connecting the Dots uh, this week, you know what a lie that is. Uh, others fear for the captives. If we keep on fighting, the captives will be killed. They're gonna, we can't make them mad or they're going to kill them, and oh, they'll take even more hostages. That's a reality. That's a reality. Uh, it's scary. Then many Jews, especially in the United States, have been brainwashed into believing lots of lies. So once again, listen to my Connecting the Dots. You'll, you'll hear about that. But, and don't forget the, the tunnels and the booby traps and the landmines, they're constantly dealing with these, these mines that are blowing up and, and killing them. The, the, that's, all these things are blocking their battle goals. And the Israelites, in the book of Numbers, faced these same challenges in the first invasion. The first invasion, the same exact, when I, when I go through these challenges a little bit, you're going to see the divided voices, and, and, and you're going to hear all these things. And we're going to look at the obstacles and numbers today, and you'll be amazed at the parallels with the battles today, and not only that, with our spiritual battles. Because the foundational testament and taking the land is a physical picture of our spiritual battle. They're trying to take a physical land. We're trying to take a spiritual land. It's all connected, completely connected. The Israelites were told to take the land. They were promised victory. Promised victory. But they didn't 
ever realize their full potential. And we're going to see a number say they didn't even get started on it because they hit some obstacles. They hit some landmines, just like many of us today do spiritually. We are told to take the land, promise the land, promise victory, but we hit spiritual landmines that trip us up. Let's pray before we get into it. Father, we thank you for the worship and the way that's prepared us. Oh, has it ever, those 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 hymns and songs and psalms prepared us for the word today, Lord. And I just thank you for the baptism and the changed lives we saw in the baptism. Lord, I pray that every one of us would be changed by your word today, by the book of Numbers. We would be changed through the Holy Spirit's power. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's good to hear Marty saying amen. We already announced you at the door. Uh, Lynn announced that. It's great to hear the amens. And don't forget the power of the... Holy Spirit. All right, I could count on Marty for that one. <clears throat> good to have you back, buddy. <clears throat> at the door and in here. All right, so three obstacles. If you look at your insert, follow along. There's three obstacles, three landmines that we face, that they face, and we do too, okay? The first one is faith. The first one is faith. It's in Numbers 13. We're going to pick it up. In Numbers 13, verses 1 to 2, and they, they lack the faith to, to knock out the enemy, okay? So in Numbers 13, verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the Israelites. And he gives it to them, but then we got to fight for every inch of it, right? They were given the land, but they had to fight for every inch of it. We're given salvation, It's a gift. Can't earn it. But once we receive that gift, guess what? We've got to fight for our sanctification. Still by God's mercy and grace. But we have to fight for every inch of it for our sanctification. So he says, uh, picking it up, which I'm giving to the Israelites from each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. They're sending leaders, top guys, <clears throat> at uh, did I hit them all? Okay, yeah. Okay, so he's, he's sending these leaders, these spies who are leaders, and, 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 and it's a really a dangerous thing. You think of spy books and spy movies, and if they get caught, they'll be killed, you know, tortured, killed, right? Executed if caught, but they're sent for a reason. In verse 3, it says this, So the Lord, at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of Israel. They were sent out. They were to find good news. They were meant to go out and motive, find, come back with motivation for, for the, how great the land is and how we can take this land. But all the way down to verse 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh and the desert of Paran. They, there they reported to them and the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Sounds sticky. Uh, anybody, anybody, <laughs> veggie tail people will get that one, you know. <laughs> Flowing with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and are very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses. He, he silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. So it was a hung jury. It's a hung jury. We're going to find out that only Caleb and Joshua thought they could do it, just like Israel's divided today, right? Politically and, and all kinds of stuff, Pol divided. You know, that's what's holding them back. <clears throat> there was a, a hung jury. Only Caleb and Joshua were positive. And the result of this hung jury was tragic. Look at verse 31. But the men who 
had gone up with him, up with Caleb, said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers, remember that, in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. Panic sets in. From Anak, which are the big guys, to the Nephilim, which are legendary. It's like saying, we saw, we saw Goliaths and Godzillas. You know, it's, it's crazy what they did. Now, the Nephilim are a mystery in the Bible. We're not quite sure. All we know for sure is that they were big and bad, and they were all died in the flood. So they're, they're, you know, they were dead. They were long, long gone. But the DNA that was spread in the human race through Noah and his descendants still had the Anakite uh, DNA in it. It's just like there are in many human beings today, there's Neanderthal DNA. And Neanderthals were not a separate creature, you know, eight people. They were human beings, uh, you know, just like we are. Uh, now that's coming out more and more. But, but many of us have D Neanderthal DNA. Uh, I'm not going to point any figures. But anyway, the... <laughs> Moving on, uh, they, the, they, had, they had the Anakite DNA, and so as a result, there were giants that had spread in the human race, and that's where Goliath came from. He was an Anakite, and uh, sons of Anak, and that was still a, 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 a DNA thread, just like you see today, you, these huge differences among the human race even now through the DNA, okay? But so what they said was true, except for the Nephilim. There were no Nephilim left, all right? But there were, there were big people. There were Goliath came from these. There was people like Goliath, huge human beings there. And they had strong fortresses, high walls. We're going to see that when we get to the book of Joshua and the battle of Jericho, the high walls. What they said was true, but it was carnal. It was worldly. They were weighing the pros and cons. They were talking about the positives and the negatives when God had told them, just do it. Just do it. Just take it. And, and look what happened because of their lack of faith here. Look what happens in Numbers 14, verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised up their voices and wept out loud. All the, Israel, all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you wish for, what you pray for. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? They're going to hire a, a minister of retreat here. Uh, then, and they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Can you believe those people? I can't relate to that at all. Can you? Retreat, retreat. Our wives and kids will be taken captive. That's a big fear in Israel today, a huge fear, and it's a real fear, right? But they, they decided to go back to Egypt. But we, it's crazy, but we see this all the time, heartbreaking. People that were once up on baptism videos here that, 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 were, that, that go back, went back to their old lives, to their old sin, to their old slavery, to their old religions that they had pulled away from the workspace religion. They went back to it. They went back to their bondages. They, 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 they fell back. It, it, it's heartbreaking. This is a picture of this very thing. It's heartbreaking. And they paid the price. The 10 unfaithful, if you've read the book of Numbers, which I gave you that assignment, the 10 unfaithful spies, those key leaders from the 10 of the tribes, they died of a plague. God sent a plague and killed them. And only Joshua and Caleb survived. They're the only two. We'll talk about more of them later. And 40 days of exploration. They were supposed to explore for 40 days. 40 days of exploration turned into a 40-year trail of tears. 40-year trail of tears. The whole, every one of them that wept and said, let's take us back to Egypt. We should have died in the de desert. 
in the wilderness, they got their wish. Every one, the whole faithless generation, everybody who was, was, an, was, an, was an adult at this time, they all died in the desert, every one of them, except for Joshua and Caleb, the only two that survived, and the children underneath. Crazy. Listen, God never said it would be easy. Never said. He just guarantees victory. Remember, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He, pr he never said it would be easy. He just promises us victory. Victory. That's that, John 16, 33 is what I just quoted. Uh, if we believe his promises and persevere in obedient faith. I'm going to say that again. If we believe his promises and persevere in obedient faith, we will, we are guaranteed victory. The only question is, do we have grasshopper faith? But they said, we're just like grasshoppers in their sight. That's, I call that grasshopper faith. Can't do, can't do. Or do we have giant faith, like Caleb? We can kill those guys. We can defeat them. Can do Caleb faith. Grasshopper faith or can do Caleb faith? What do we have? That is the whole key to our victory. The second thing is huge, too. The second landmine is sin. And this is in Numbers 22 to 25, and I hope you did read it, but I'm going to give you a, a, a summary on it. Uh, King Balak of Moab is scared. He sees God's power giving the Israelite army victory as they move toward the promised land, as they're moving through the wilderness and coming up to the Jordan River. He sees them having victory after victory, and he's scared. So he hires Balaam the sorcerer, Balaam the sorcerer, to curse the Israelites. This guy had this demonic power to do this, right? And we find this wild farm story. Did we find the farm story? Wild farm story, Balaam's donkey talks. See, Shrek didn't have the first talking donkey. Balaam had the first talking donkey, right? And in Numbers, this is crazy, the, the, Numbers 22, verse 26. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn either to the right or the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat it with his staff. The Lord opened the donkey's mouth and it said to Balaam, what have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, you have made a fool of me. If only I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I ever been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn, so he bowed down and fell face down. Is, is this crazy? This guy didn't even think anything of the donkey talking. He was so mad and so greedy and so focused on getting those cows and rewards and cursing the Israelites. He just started having a conversation with his donkey. He didn't say, wait, how are you talking? No, he's just, you know, uh, he's crazy, right? So God warns Balaam, and he, and he says, I used the donkey to warn you, pal, because you are a donkey. If you look up in the King James Version, you know what he really was. Anyway, uh, <laughs> we're not going there, but it's in the Bible, King James, right? Uh, and, and he tells him, you, you are the real donkey here. You had better only say what I tell you to say. And so Balaam gets the point. I almost got the point totally. And, and he, he goes out and he starts to try to curse them. But every time he spoke, he blessed them. Four times he did it. He kept trying to do something bad. He couldn't because God gave him, overpowered him, and he blessed them four times. Meanwhile, King Balak is like, if you can't say something bad, don't say anything at all. I'm keeping my cows. He was very angry. But Balaam couldn't curse them. He had no power over the Israelites. It's the same today. Satan cannot touch us without God's permission. He can't touch us unless we open, unless we open the door. 
We opened the window, which is what they sadly did. They sadly did. Balaam couldn't curse them. He couldn't curse them, but he wants his cows. He wants the money that King Balak had offered him. So he comes up with plan B. This is dangerous for us. Plan B. And we know this was Balaam's idea because in Numbers 31, it says it was Balaam's idea. And God ended up judging him for his big idea. He, he, he was killed in battle as judgment from God. You should always listen to your donkeys. Listen to your donkeys. But look at how Balaam finally earned his cows and neutralized the Israelites' military power. Look at what he did. In Numbers 25, 1 to 3, it, he, he, it, this tells us what happened. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women, who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked, remember that word? I'm going to come back to it. Yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. Their military conquest, <laughs> screeching halt. It was terrible because what they had done. This was very serious. Look what it says. It was sexual sin and sacrifice. Guess what we know what they sacrificed to the Baals. It wasn't just some food. It wasn't just a the lamb. They, we also know, through, if you were with me, through Elijah and Elisha, you know what was central in the sacrifice to the Baals and uh, uh, the Baals of the land. And that was babies, children, children and babies. Look what God warned them in Numbers 35, 33. He says this, do not pollute the land where you are. Bloodshed pollutes the land. And atonement cannot be made for the land on which blood has been shed except by the blood of the one who shed it. Bloodshed Killing, murdering, pollutes the land, and there must be atonement made. The worst possible pollution is murder, and there has been no more murder than the murder of babies in the United States. 60 million and counting. God knows where this is going. We have a good idea, don't we? You talk about pollution, and that's what they did, sacrificing the babies. All over the world, they're digging up the Incas and the Peru, and they keep finding all these, in England, the Celtics, all they find is children have, with their heads smashed in. All over Central America, South America, North America, children sacrificed. It's a dumb, de Satan wants dead children, dead babies. And here we are, we see this verse about how it pollutes the land. And it's ironic in the United States today, the very people most focused on pollution and global warming are the ones who are totally committed to abortion, which is the true pollution, polluting and destroying our country. There's nothing worse destroying us. Remember what I said through Elijah and Elisha, abortion Killing, sacrificing babies was God's final straw, the final straw. And we have grasped that final straw here in this country, right? So back to Balaam. Balaam comes up with this plan. If you can't beat them, join them. He couldn't curse them, so he had to try to figure out a way to get them to open the door to the curse. You can't beat them, join them. He sends pretty women over and, and sends them over, and he starts putting Bell Light commercials on TV, you know? Where, you know the girls in the bikinis and the beer, you know? And, and, and invite them to the barbecue, and then while they get to the barbecue, now let's say grace to our idols, just this once, to our idols, and let the orgy begin. Because the worship of Baals involved not just child sacrifice, but orgies every time, every time. And it worked just like it works today. Some of you might be watching an NFL game today, and you're watching, and what comes on? A Bell Light commercial. Well, they call it Bud Light, but it's the same thing. There's these women, you know, you know, you know offering all kinds of great things, you know, to, you know, you know, the commercials and the cheerleaders, and it, it's the same thing, trying to entice. You see, Satan can't hurt us. He cannot 
curse us if we're under the blood of Jesus Christ. He can't do it. If you're not a Christian, you're a sitting duck. I, I, hope, I hope if you're out there and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a sitting duck. You have no protection. But once we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're under the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are protected. Satan can't touch us. He can't curse, just like Balaam couldn't curse. Also, don't forget the book of Job, how Satan wanted to go after Job, and he couldn't do it. Job 1.9, where he says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands uh, you have, uh, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. You put a, God has put a hedge around us if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. There's a hedge. The demons cannot touch us without God's permission. Now, God does permit. God does permit. Paul and his thorn in the flesh. God does permit for his purpose. For his purpose, he allows persecution, he allows martyrdom, he allows lots of things to Christians, but he has a purpose. It has to be his permission. There has to be God's permission. Nothing can touch us without that. Uh, Revolution and World Mission, I never forgot this story. There was a, a native missionary uh, in India. His name was Jesus Das. And he, uh, he was, went into a, a, a village and he began to preach the gospel there. But this village was controlled by four pagan priests who controlled it through witchcraft. And uh, stories were told how the priests could kill people's cattle and even people themselves with their witchcraft. They would put these spells on them and, and kill them. People would die with no explanation except that they ticked off these witch, witch doctors. Uh, but when ha Jesus Das came in, many people put their faith in Jesus Christ. This is in Wor Revolution World Mission, K.P. Yohannan, great, great book. Uh, but the priests were outraged that so many people were putting their faith in Jesus. And so they warned Jesus Das. They warned him. They said, if you don't leave the village, we're going to call our gods out and kill you. And your wife and children will all die. All die. But Jesus Das did not leave. He continued to preach. And the villagers continued to to be saved. Finally, after a few weeks, the witch doctors came and asked him the secret of his power. What's your secret power? This is the first time our power did not work. We asked the spirits to go kill your family. But the spirits came back and told us they could not approach you or your family because you were always surrounded by fire. So we called more powerful spirits to go after you, but they do return saying they, that not only were you surrounded by fire, but also there were angels around you all the time. Jesus Das then told them about Jesus Christ and his power. And all four witch doctors put their faith in Jesus. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. That's, that's what we have because of the blood of Jesus Christ. That protection. The, 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 the demons can't touch us without God's permission. Satan can't touch us. So what does he do? He tempts us. He tempts us with beautiful sins to get us to take our protection down, our guard down. On TV, he uses beautiful men and women to offer us every sin possible. And it's getting worse by the day. He gives us computers and phones that, that we have unbelievable you know, access to pornography shot, knocked into us. And it's no accident that they know that the latest study I just read, 90% of all men in America look at pornography at least monthly, and 50% of women do the same. Demonic. It's a demon. Boy, I've cast demons out of people addicted to porn. I've cast them out. And it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. It's demonic. I'm not saying if you look at porn one time, you're going to have a demon, but you're becoming demonized, and if you're completely addicted, I'm telling you, you are demonized, possessed. 
And it's going to take the Holy Spirit's power to break that. It's powerful, powerful. Get your healing. Dating relationships, he tempts us with dating a non-Christian, even though 2 Corinthians 6.14 says this very thing. He says, do not be yoked. Remember the word yoked, remember? Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? Don't, don't yoke, don't yoke. You just like yoke to the Baal, we are yoked to someone if we marry a non-Christian or even date them, seriously. Uh, he offers us affairs, just emotional, just think about it. There's no harm. There's just thinking about it. there's no problem with that. Not. What did Jesus say? Whoever lusts in his heart has already committed adultery. It's just as bad. And then it crosses the line and the dam breaks and there's devastating damage done. Just compromise. He tells teenagers, just compromise. You know, peer pressure, uses the peer pressure. Just drink and just, you know, just do these drugs. It's just pot. You know, have you seen the latest stats on pot? Just pot. It, they said it's so powerful now. It, it's dangerous for anybody to smoke it. It's crazy. Uh, just, just go along with the sexual sin. It's, you know, compromise, peer pressure. Or just bow down to our idols. Uh, worship what we do, our celebrities, our materialism, our money, our way of thinking. It, it's that constant pressure we face. Beautiful sins. Satan offers us beautiful, not ugly sins. He offers us beautiful sins, right? They look good, but sin looks good, but it kills us, as the Israelites all found out. It looks good, but it's going to kill us. I, I had a, a friend whose son had a pet rattlesnake, and he had to have this rattlesnake. It was up in the east. I'm not going to say what state, because he'll, in case he ever listened. But anyway, the, <clears throat> the, the, he had this rattlesnake, and the parents were like, get rid of this rattlesnake. No, I like it. I like it. I like it. And one day, it bit him. Bit him. And he was in bad shape. He's going to die, because there's no you know, antidote. In the, up here, there's no rattlesnake. So they had to f fly it from Texas, the antidote, all the way up and, and to, to the northeast to save this guy's life, this dodo. But we do the same thing, don't we? Many Christians, they, I've seen it all, and I've struggled with this too. We, we, we're saved. We get excited. We're on our way to the promised land. We get baptized. We have spiritual victory, but we let Sin. I've seen so many, let, we let sin sidetrack us. And then we start to wander in the desert. And then these very people that were baptized and on fire for Jesus, I see them fall spiritually. I see them die spiritually. And many of them even die physically from the sin. The final landmine is very closely tied to sin. It's what sin becomes if we let it stay long enough, and that's a stronghold. And I love the, the, the songs Todd picked out about every stronghold broken, perfect, perfect application to this. It becomes a stronghold if we let it. In Numbers 33, 50 to 56, talks about these very strongholds, three key strongholds that God warns them about. He said, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, Drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Destroy all their carved images and cast idols. Demolish all their high places. Did you catch this? We're going to come back to that. Take possession of the land and settle in it, for I've given you the land to possess. Distribute the land by lot according to your clans to a larger group, give a larger inheritance to the smaller group, a smaller inheritance. Whatever falls to them by lot will be theirs. Distribute it according to... <clears throat> to your ancestral tribes. Now, here we go. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land, those you allow to remain will become barbs in your eyes and thorns in your sides. They will give you trouble in the land where you will live, and then I will do to you what I plan to do to them. Wow. 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 Strongholds are something or someone we allow to remain in our life that constantly pulls us down or has the potential to knock us down at any time. Inhabitants. He talked about the inhabitants. That's someone. Idols. That's something. High places. That's somewhere. You get that? A person, place, or thing, but it's no game. 
a person, place, or thing that is Satan's trump card. Ephesians 4, 26 says this, in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. They're talking about anger, but it could be anything. Don't give the devil a foothold that he can go to. That's Satan's trump card that he can go to. You can all, we can all think of it, am I right? We can all think of many things that, that he can go to at any time to knock us down or knock us out or to shame us. Oh, even if we're not, he loves to shame us with that, right? For example, some, you've been hurt by someone, and I see this a lot, and we end up angry and bitter because of that. And it affects our relationships. When we have that anger and bitterness, it, it affects all of our relationships. It's not just the person who hurt us, but it affects all of them. It, it even affects our relationship with God when we have bitterness right? Not, I'm not talking about anger that we, mad, anger is a good thing, it's a God-given emotion, but when it becomes a foothold, when it becomes bitterness, that's when it can do damage. We take it into our family relationships, we can take it into a church, when people come into our church, bitter, even at another church, I'm like, well, you got to deal with that first, don't bring it in here, got to help you break that, but we, we, we need to break that through forgiveness, we have to break it through forgiveness. We have to talk to someone. The Bondage Breakers, awesome book. The Search for Significance, we use with a lot of people. It, we have to break that. Maybe abortion is your shame. Maybe abortion, you've been haunted by. I know, I, we know lots of women here have had abortions and shared that and got their freedom. But, but you, you've had abortion, and, and because of your abortion, men and women, it, you're haunted by that. Listen, repentance frees us. Repentance will free you. You can take it to the one place. Take your shame of an abortion to the one place that Satan can't reach you. The cross. Whatever is shaming us, the cross of Jesus Christ, under the blood of Jesus Christ, it's the only place Satan can't touch us. And if you, and I stress this with, you know, what, if you're struggling with shame, abortion shame, any shame, put it, put it under the blood of Jesus Christ. It, talk to someone. T tell me you need to talk to someone. Tell Kim. We, believe, we have plenty of people who can talk to you and tell you how God has given them healing from this. And we have a flyer on the back. You can call someone confidentially. Uh, you know, get your healing. Take it to the cross. Be free. That's the one place Shame cannot touch us. Satan's shame can't touch us. The cross of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, whatever it is. The Israelites were defeated. They were defeated. They lost their way. They finally got going again in the book of Joshua. We could wait till we get there. That's 40 years from now. That's a long time. And, but, but we don't have to be. They lost their way, but we don't have to. Do you have the faith? to live in the victory that we are promised. Maybe there's an area of defeat in your life right now that's God's bringing, that you have given up. You have given up. I want to tell you to get back up. If you have given up, get back up. Get back up. Go to the throne of grace. Go to God's throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16. If you don't have this memorized, <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Let us then approach the throne of grace, God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Keep, memorize that and keep going to that throne of grace for God's mercy and grace. Boy, I pray that mercy and grace at least 100 times a day. At least at least a hundred times, say, God, mercy and grace. Forgive me. Give me forgiveness and give me strength. Mercy and grace. If you don't remember anything else from the sermon, remember mercy and grace and keep praying it. And then depend on God's word. Depend on his promises. Study God's word. Memorize. Meditate on his promises. It's so important. Is there a stronghold in your life? Is there a stronghold that needs breaking? Some, something, someone, some place that is holding you back. Break free. Just as I say, get up, break free. Remember the R's I always stress? Repent, renounce, resist, and 
renew, repent, walk the other way, renounce, break the, the hold of that, uh, uh, re, re, resist, submit yourself then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you, keep on fighting, and then renew. We've got to renew the mind. Got to renew the mind. That's what affects our life. Renewing. Connect with someone who can help you. We have whatever you're struggling with, we have someone who can help you, believe me. We got it all covered. We got it all covered. If you say to me, oh, Pastor Chuck, I have this problem. Can you connect me with someone? I'm not going to be like, oh, I can't believe that. <laughs> believe me, you can't shock me. We got it all covered here. We got it all covered here. I know what God has helped me free from. I totally understand. We, I've had to fight many, many struggles in my life, still battling them. It never ends. If you're breathing, you got to be fighting. People say, when is it going to end? I go, when you stop breathing. But if you're breathing, there's going to be a battle. Just know that, right? And we'll find someone to help you and go the distance with you. It's not just one time. It's going the distance with you, sticking with you. It's vital to get our victory. Out of all the adults, all the adults in the book of Numbers, only Caleb and Joshua made it to the promised land. That's it. Crazy, right? N Numbers 14.38. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, survived. The only ones. And everybody else above the you know, adult age died too. Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ. You remember going through the book of jo Joshua, anybody? Uh, we're gonna, when we hit Joshua again, I'm going to focus on that again here in a few weeks. But as we'll see in the book of Joshua, he is a type of Jesus Christ. Joshua is a Hebrew word. Jesus, it, Jesus is the Greek form. It means God saves. He's a picture of Jesus, what he did. And Caleb, who had faith, can't do Caleb. He followed Joshua through the Jordan River, the river of judgment. It's literally what it means, judgment. Followed him through to the promised land. And he won what was promised. Will we follow Jesus Christ to victory, to claiming the promises, receiving the blessings? Will you do that? Please don't be someone we see on a baptism video down the road, and I don't even want to watch a baptism video anymore because half of them wandered off. Victory. Victory. Faith. Breaking the strongholds. And, and maybe you're here saying you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You can't win the victory. You can't break free. You're a slave to Satan. You're his child, the Bible says. Jesus said that. But if you decide to follow Jesus, you can break free right now. You can repent, say, God, I repent. I turn away from my sinful life, my old life. I give you my life. I put my faith, my trust, my hope in Jesus Christ. That's what John 3.16 is talking about when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's pray. What a book, the book of Numbers. How is the Holy Spirit speaking to us right now? Maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus. You can't be free. You're a sitting duck to Satan and to sin and to the world. There is one hope, and that is Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to break the power of sin, who rose from the dead to give us a brand new life, the power to live by the Holy Spirit. And you can have that 
new life and that power by putting your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ. The prayer of faith that begins with, God, I repent. I turn away from sin in my old sinful self. I put my faith in Jesus, his death on that cross to pay for my sin, his blood that breaks the power of sin, his resurrection that gives me a new life, the power of the Holy Spirit. I put my faith in Jesus. I ask you to forgive me because I'm putting my faith in Jesus. <clears throat> I'm giving my life to Jesus. If you have prayed that prayer of faith, Putting your faith in Jesus Christ. Something incredible, amazing, mind-boggling has happened. You are a new creation in Christ. You are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing can touch you without his permission. You have the Holy Spirit living in you, the power of the Holy Spirit. Helping you fight life's battles now. And I want to encourage you to tell somebody you've given your life to Jesus. Tell someone. Tell me on the way out. Fill out the card, stick it in the box. Tell a family member, a friend here, or someone out there. You, somebody's been praying for you, talking to you, <coughs> witnessing to you. Tell somebody so they can go the distance with you. For those of us who have already put our faith in Christ, how is the Holy Spirit convicting us? We all have battles with our faith. We all have battles with sin and strongholds. But will we get back up? Will we go to the throne of God's mercy and grace? Well, we do whatever it takes to break free, even if we have to share it with somebody, which is really important. Confess your sins one to another is really powerful. Find someone you can trust who, who will go the distance with you. Father, I pray that no one here will, will dry up in that desert this wilderness that we live in, that we would live victorious, that we would cross that Jordan River, that we would take our promised possession, the peace, the joy, the real life you've offered us. I pray that for each person here in Jesus' name. Amen.